This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Most of you aren't just listening to this show right now. You might be driving, cleaning, exercising at the same time. But what if you could be saving money by switching to Progressive? Drivers who save by switching save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Multitask right now. Quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Hey there, Culture Gab Fest listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. Is your business reaching an exciting turning point? Are you ready to seize the moment for growth? Well, when you're facing tough decisions, SAP can help you be ready for anything that happens next. To learn more, head to sap.com slash be ready and stick around to hear how the president of an esports league sees the moment. I'm Dana Stevens, and this is the Slate Culture Gab Fest. Passages is not for the prudes edition. It's Wednesday, August 23rd, 2023. And on today's show, Passages, the eighth film from the independent writer-director Ira Sachs, has been the subject of some controversy in the weeks since its release because of its NC-17 rating and its explicit gay and straight sex scenes. The movie tells the story of a complicated and ultimately toxic love triangle unfolding in Paris. It stars Franz Wachowski, Ben Wishaw, and Adele Exarchopoulos. We will discuss... Then, the FX series Justified, based on an Elmore Leonard novella and starring Timothy Oliphant as a U.S. Marshal in Harlan County, Kentucky, came to an end in 2015 after six seasons. But now, Oliphant's character, the laid-back yet hot-tempered Raylan Givens, is back in a limited series on Hulu called Justified City Primeval. This time, he's enforcing the law, not in the hollers of Appalachia, but in the streets of Detroit. We'll discuss that show. And finally, the one-time NFL star Michael Orr, whose life story was the subject of the Oscar-winning 2009 movie The Blind Side, has filed papers to end the conservatorship that he says he was tricked into signing at age 18 by Leanne and Sean Toohey, the white Memphis couple who took him into their home. His case is a fascinating convergence of issues having to do with race, adoption, exploitation, and fame. We'll get into that at the end of the show. But first, let me introduce this week's co-hosts. Julie and Steve are both out this week, but it's okay because we have two fantastic people sitting in. First of all, Laura Miller, Slate's books and culture columnist. Laura, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to be here. And also on our panel is Rebecca Onion, senior editor at Slate and longtime friend of our podcast. Hey, Rebecca. Hi. Thanks for having me back. All right, well, let's get into the show itself. The filmmaker Ira Sachs has long specialized in making small-scale, intimate indie films about relationships, often gay relationships. He's an out gay man himself. His latest, Passages, tells the story of a love triangle among three young people in Paris. There's a gay male couple, Thomas and Martin, who work respectively as a film director and a printmaker, and a young French schoolteacher named Agathe. Before we get into our discussion of passages, let's hear a clip from early in the film. Here, you'll hear the voices of Franz Rogowski as Tomas and Ben Wishaw as Martin. They're a longtime couple, and Tomas is just coming back from having spent the night with a young woman he met at the rap party for his latest movie. You know what I was doing last night? No, but whatever it was, you sound very excited. I had sex with a woman. Can I tell you about it, please? Yes, of course. I felt something I hadn't felt in a very long time. And it I wanted to hear this. It was exciting. It was something different. It's sick what's happening between us. For real. You hate me, don't you? All right, Laura, I'm going to start with you. I think that, like me, you were somewhat befuddled by the movie Passages and what it was trying to do. I'll give you some of my response to it after I, I hear yours. But okay. what do you make of of this complicated love triangle in Passages? Well, I have to say that I found it difficult to sit through the whole movie because I found the character of Tomas so repellent from almost the first scene. The character is sort of 
sort of preening and needy at the same time. And he has this sort of way of holding his body that just maybe it triggers some past narcissist I used to know. But um, I really, like I had to stop multiple times because I just could not bear the fact that he was on the screen. Um, <laughs> and and he's pretty on much, the screen pretty much every moment, right? I mean, yeah, if there's, there's a main character, it's probably Tomas. Right. And there's one scene towards the end where Martin and Agat meet in like a cafe. And I felt this incredible sense of relief and then like engagement just because Tomas wasn't there. And the two characters who I found really appealing and also who are both really attractive, whereas I just do not think Rogowski is attractive at all, um, were finally at the center. And and I did not have this this horrible, you know, entity just spoiling the whole thing (laughs) So I had, a, I think I had a particularly strong and I guess idiosyncratic reaction to this because, of course, while there are a lot of sex scenes in it, I didn't find them sexy because I found him so, um, as I said, repellent. I wonder if that's an idiosyncratic reaction because I recognize my response in it too, and I feel somewhat relieved because. After seeing this movie, my whole question was, why would an entire anguished love triangle erupt around such an unappealing figure as Tomas? Oh, good. <laughs> totally. But then I started reading the, the reviews of this movie, which is at 92% on Rotten Tomatoes, and I, and I felt like everyone was responding to it as this really mature, interesting exploration of relationships and you know, sort of um, alternate love arrangements. And anyway, I, 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 I sort of felt like I must have missed the point of passages because I just don't understand why you would break your heart over someone as unappealing, not even necessarily physically unappealing to me as just just morally repellent <laughs> as Tomas. And I'm so glad to know that I'm not the only judgy person who could not get into him. But what about you, Rebecca? What's What, what did you feel about this movie? And if you want to get into as well, the other two characters and sort of fill out a bit the sense of the world of this movie. Yeah, um, I totally agree with you guys. So I think we're, <laughs> we're gonna just be a anti Tomas podcast today. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I think part of the problem is, I mean, it's interesting, like we, we read the Richard Brody review in the New Yorker, uh, which is headlined passages and an art monsters fierce purity, which led me to believe that uh, Tomas's art was going to be more at the center of this movie, like that he was going to become interesting to me and sort of like compelling. And I was going to understand why, oh, maybe like, you know, these two extremely attractive others, his longtime partner, um, who Ben Wishaw, it plays, you know, uh, as a very attractive man. Um, and Agat, who's a young, gorgeous school teacher, why they would want to be with him so badly. But I didn't really get a sense of his art or I couldn't really... Um, I, I don't know. You see him directing at the beginning and you hear him talking about it, but you get more of a sense even actually of, of the husband's art. You see him in his printmaking shop and you see him sort of talking about what, what he's doing. Um, yeah. So I, I totally agree with you guys on that. I think what maybe could have like ameliorated that response or, or kind of like smoothed it a little bit. I actually feel like it's going to be a weird thing to say. I wish there were more sex scenes in some ways. I think that the way that he is when he's having sex is like, we can talk about this. Let's, let's get into the sex part of it. But um, uh, there's really only, I think, three interludes, maybe three or four interludes. One pretty extensive one between him and his husband, a few with a got. And there's sort of like a, a vibe that he emits in the scenes, Tomas I'm talking about, the unappealing one, um, that makes me sort of understand it a little bit more or feel like a little bit more, um, like I can see why these other two characters who both seem like fairly good people who want like a stability out of life um, might be momentarily sort of like shifted off their axes by a person like this. But to me, that I, this was not like a very sexy movie at all, uh, which was how it was sort of like presented and painted for having an NC-17 rating. 
Yeah, I mean, the NC-17 rating is is a whole separate issue and away from the quality of the movie. I think often when NC-17 ratings happen, as opposed to R ratings, and there's always, you know, this thin line in between the two, right? Like what specific acts or what specific images would push it over the edge? Um, you know, that the complaint is that it's often because, you know, the, the kind of sex being shown is not sort of mainstream, straight, white, hetero, cis sex um, that, that those restrictions get put on the movie and I think that critique could be made of this movie because the sex scenes are not especially explicit they're fairly long but they're relatively modest but they do often show not always but often show you know two men going at it whether it's the two men of this main couple or the um the lover that that Martin takes later after Tomas leaves him for a got um and so I think I could object to those scenes being condemned as NC-17 and say that this movie should have been given an R rating so as to make it accessible to more people without saying that I think it's a great movie. And I sort of agree with you, Rebecca, that I could have used not just some more sex scenes, but some more movie. You know, this is a, a pretty short movie, and it's I, I respect that it tries to get things done in a, in a slim running time. I think it's under 90 minutes long. Uh, but... I just found it incredibly underwritten. And some of the things that I found other critics admiring about it in their reviews, which is the kind of elliptical structure of the story, just wound up really frustrating me because some of the key moments in the movie, and I won't give away what they are so as not to spoil some of the twists, but they happen off screen, right? So you see two people from this triangle, two points of the triangle meeting up, talking about something that happened in the other part of the triangle. That's really key to moving the entire story forward. But we never see the moment that that was first revealed, right? We only hear sort of like the the secondhand aftermath of its revelation. And I think the point of that was to keep us sort of off center and, you know, not to, to, to be too uh, beat by beat in the way that the story unfurled. But it ended up making me feel as if we didn't get to know the most important things about why these people mattered to each other. I think you are right, though, Rebecca, that if Tomas is supposed to have one redeeming quality, it must be that he's really good in bed. <laughs> because it seems like <laughs> as soon as he sleeps with someone, they're willing to you know, rearrange their entire life in order to either take him in or take him back. But for example, the moment that he decides to leave his husband, basically his longtime partner, and uh, and move in with this young woman seems very uh, unexpected to the viewer because you never saw her invite him to move in. <laughs> you never saw a moment when the relationship shifted in that way. So it just seems like he goes from having a one night stand in what seems like it was kind of an open relationship with his husband in the first place to packing up his books and moving out. Yeah, I think that um, we're supposed to see him as as just acting completely on impulse. So he's infatuated with this young woman. And so he just decides that now he has to be with her. I mean, that Richard Brody piece that we read is probably one of the most demented pieces of criticism I've read in many a year. <laughs> and part of what he says is that the is is that you know that the guy's a really good filmmaker, not you know, you know, we don't we never see a you know a frame of film that he has made, but we know he's good because he just goes crashing around through other people's lives acting on impulse and he's the spirit of the cinema and he's breaking them out of their settled routines and unleashing all this passion and then you watch it and I I have to admit I read this first and I was like what movie did this guy see (laughs) all he does is go he's is just walk all over people and traumatize them And, and bizarrely he doesn't even mention the issue that 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 Dana just referred to, which is really heartbreaking and really makes you recognize how completely almost irredeemable Tomas is. And um, I mean, the movie does not have a huge amount of narrative tension to it, but to the extent that it did, the thing that kept me going back to it, despite the fact that I hated looking at the guy, was that I wanted to see these two really pretty lovely people finally get to the point where they realized what a bastard he was and that is delivered on that you get that and you and it and it is satisfying I just don't know if it was worth all the stuff that went before to me 
I'm also not sure that that's the narrative satisfaction that the movie is setting out to provide. You know, I think that that's, mm. I really yeah. wish that I had seen this with somebody who loved it. <laughs> I saw it actually with Chris Melanfi, another friend of our our podcast. <laughs> but I think that some viewers are reading the movie really differently and some really smart critics who I respect, like Richard Lawson at Vanity Fair, um, has really praised this movie and said something about it that I think is true, which is that it doesn't feel like an American film. You know, although Ira Sachs is an American director, this takes place in Paris. And I do think that it has some of the, you know, the ambivalence and the uh, the willingness to go to unlikable places with its characters that, um, that a European movie might have. I think that the texture of the movie and the, the, the world that it creates is believable enough and and exciting enough that I want to enter into it. But then, as you say, Laura, I just get repelled by the fact that the main character, who everybody is buzzing around as if he's the most desirable and important person on screen, is is so unappealing. I think I'd recommend people see this despite our despite the segment that we just recorded that uh, is pretty uh, negative about Tomas. I think I'd still recommend that people see it, if only for the way that the the sex is woven into the story is something that is thought provoking and interesting to me. Um, and I think that it's like a little rare now to be able to see a movie like this that tries to do something with the sex. Like it's the sex is like, um, I don't want to say realistic, but it's not, it's not gauzy. It's not filmed with like a filter. It's not, they're not even doing it in dark rooms. It's like very, uh, I don't know, you hear all the little like grunts and whimpers and stuff. And that to me is interesting and worth seeing and not common. Um, That's true. And it's also narratively important. I mean, several exactly. of the sex scenes advance yeah. the plot in an important right. way, <laughs> you know, yes. sometimes because of who is overhearing all the grunts and whimpers as they're, you know, emerging. So, yeah, I mean, there's so much about this movie that's unusual on the on the current landscape, you know. So if you want to see a movie that is adult and honest and complicated. It certainly is is all three of those things. And I know that some viewers have responded very differently to Tomas. I mean, in fact, I've, I've read quite a few responses to the movie that say, you know, while he is obviously this really complicated, difficult person who winds up being toxic to both of the other two people in the triangle, that, you know, they also come out of the movie with a sense of, of sympathy for him and that his uh, his moments of humiliation are, you know, are also painful to watch for them. Well, Whereas I just well found them earned. a deserved come yeah. up. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I sort of wish we had somebody on the panel to stand up for passages. Maybe somebody who's listening has seen it and wants to write in their own passionate defense of, of Tomas and of the movie. At any rate, I'm glad that I saw it and I really enjoyed our conversation about it. The movie is Passages. It's showing only in theaters right now, but it will no doubt be streaming on some platform in the near future. Let us know what you think at culturefest at slate.com. All right, moving on. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. How do you know when to seize the moment for growth? When your opportunity arrives, you need to be ready. From expanding into new markets to hiring, business leaders face so many tough decisions. My name is Brendan Donahue, president of the NBA 2K League. The NBA 2K League is a professional esport run by the NBA and 2K, where we take 30 million people who play the game of NBA 2K and we find the best 125 in the world to compete in our league. In March of 2020, the start of the pandemic spurred the league to take steps it never imagined. And with SAP tools, they knew they were ready. We could have postponed our season like a lot of other sports leagues did. We decided to seize the moment. We created a competition that could be done virtually. We had the NBA 2K League on major sports networks for 17 weeks. That moment gave us a chance to talk to a mass audience across the world. So the majority of our fans, less than 1% will ever step foot in an NBA arena to watch a game live. But you have this significant fandom and excitement for the game. And so that's really where we think we play a role. Our first season, we had 650,000 people watch our finals in season one. Now our finals this past year, we had 2.2 million people watching. NBA 2K League seized the moment for growth. Will you? Head to sap.com slash be ready to learn more. This episode is supported by About the Journey, an original podcast from Marriott Bonvoy Traveler. What does it mean to travel better? 
In season three of About the Journey, travel journalist Onika Raymond takes us on a journey to discover the lesser-known sides of six iconic cities around the globe. This season, she's picked six under-the-radar neighborhoods, where she'll meet with in-the-know locals to experience what makes their homes one of a kind. From the unapologetically Dominican jewel of Upper Manhattan to London's Nigerian-British community known as Little Lagos, Onika connects with locals who can speak to the heart of the dynamic neighborhoods we're traveling to. They'll tell us where to go, what to do, and how to see the world in more sustainable and meaningful ways. About the Journey highlights local experiences, providing an intimate and exciting new perspective to popular destinations like Washington, D.C. and Denver. Search for About the Journey in your podcast player. We'll also include a link in the show notes. Thanks to About the Journey for their support. It's time to take a moment to tell our listeners about this week's business. There is only one item of business this week, and that's to tell you all about our Slate Plus segment. I'm going to be talking with Laura and Rebecca about an article in The New Yorker by the novelist Jonathan Franzen. It's called The Problem of Nature Writing. And in this piece, Franzen basically talks about what good nature writing should look like and why he feels like most nature writing that he reads doesn't live up to that standard and doesn't get people to start caring about the environment the way he would like. We'll talk about that piece and our own relationship to nature writing in this week's Slate Plus segment. So if you belong to Slate Plus, you will hear that at the end of the show. If you don't belong to Slate Plus, of course, you can sign up at slate.com slash culture plus. When you're a Slate Plus member, you get ad-free podcasts, you get bonus content like the segment I just described, and lots of other shows have them too. And best of all, you get unlimited access to all of the writing on Slate. When you're a Slate Plus member, you're supporting our show and you're supporting the work of all our wonderful colleagues. These memberships are what helps keep Slate going. So please sign up today at slate.com slash culture plus. Once again, that's slate.com slash culture plus. Okay, back to the show. The TV series Justified ran for six seasons on FX from 2010 to 2015. It was based on a character who had appeared in multiple novels by the legendary crime writer Elmore Leonard. It followed the U.S. Marshal Raylan Givens, played by Timothy Oliphant, fighting crime on his home turf of Harlan County, Kentucky. Now it's eight years after that series ended and Raylan Givens is back. This time he's hot on the trail of judicial corruption and organized crime in Detroit in the new limited series Justified City Primeval, also based on an Elmore Leonard novel, which I believe did not have Raylan Givens in it. So it's a kind of combination of one of his books and one of his characters from another book. Before we get into our discussion of Justified City Primeval, let's hear a clip from an episode early in the season. Here, you'll hear the voice of Timothy Oliphant as Raylan Givens talking to his 15-year-old daughter, Willa, who is played by Oliphant's real-life daughter, Vivian Oliphant. I hope the hotel has a pool. Willa, we're not going to a hotel. You're leaving. We're leaving. You're flying home. I'm staying here. But Mom's on vacation. Not anymore. Let's talk in the car. I spend more than two weekends a month with you and you gotta get rid of me? Get in the car, please, and and hold the drum. You backstabbed me after you said you wouldn't. Give me my bat. Willa, I cannot do my job and take care of you. Mom does. And I will not put you or that nice family that's offering us their home at any more risk than I already have. If you wanted me here, you would find a way to keep me safe. Rebecca, I'm going to start with you because I know you were a devotee of the original Justified series. Before we get into this new incarnation of Raylan Givens, can you talk about the original show and and why it was special to you? Oh, sure. Um, So the show was so deeply and Embedded in Harlan County, despite the fact that I believe it was filled in California, which always kind of took me back a little bit to see the landscape looking so different. But um, the central character, Raylan, is both a person who grew up there and a person who's been away and come back. And the deepest relationship in the show between Raylan and uh, a Boyd Crowder, who's played by uh, Walton Goggins, who's wonderful in the original show, um, is the central antagonist, who's sort of a guy who grew up there, stayed there, and got into crime. So you have these two guys, both of whom, uh, you know, come from the same place, who end up sort of back in the same place and circling around one another and encountering all the people that they knew you know, as they were growing up, different families that they have had contact with in different ways um, and have 
reacted differently to the economic destruction that is like shaping the world of Harlan County. And it's not sentimental. It's not like poverty porn, which is something that people accuse representations of Appalachia being a lot. It's like very dry and funny. Um, and Timothy Oliphant is wonderful as Raylan. And he's got like this uh, kind of like cool irascibility um, affect down quite perfectly. You guys, did you guys watch the original show or no? I did. And I loved it too. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about it on the podcast. So I watched part of the first season. That was back when we, you know, in an earlier era of TV where we often didn't revisit shows. So I don't think I've ever seen it past the first few episodes. I'm not even sure that the Walton Goggins character had entered or had become important anyway, at the point that I had seen the show. But what I remember about it the most is certainly Timothy Oliphant and that style that you're talking about. That's this combination of, you know, he's he he seems at once very relaxed and incredibly hot tempered, you know. Yeah. And I think that's brought out pretty well in in the new show. Well, given that you, Rebecca, you cite place and the sense of regionality as being a big part of the appeal of the original Justified, I wonder how you feel about Raylan Givens and his cowboy hat being transplanted to to Detroit. How do you think it works in, in that context? It actually worked really well for me as a reboot, as a, as a place for a reboot. Like I would have been, I think I would have been more annoyed with the reboot if they'd gone back to Harlan. But I don't know. What do you think, Laura? Because you also liked the original series. I did miss the sense of place because I don't feel like there's that much sense of Detroit as a place. You know, it just feels like a kind of randomly selected location. Um, but, you know, I'm just always glad to see more Raylan Givens and the dialogue is written with the same panache, the Leonard-esque panache as the original series. I mean, he's the great thing I like about Raylan is that he's amused so much of the time by humanity and its foibles and how dumb criminals sometimes are and how perverse people are, um, which is, I think... A, a very Elmore Leonard trait, and that it, it's just really refreshing because television detectives tend to be these super broody, self-righteous, self-serious characters, and his, and they don't give you as much of a sense of like the sort of run-of-the-mill tasks of law enforcement. Um, but I, I felt like Justified really gave you a sense of that, not just of of Raylan as like a crusader against the bad guys. Um, there are things that I like about where the plot goes and things that I, devices that I didn't appreciate as well. So, but I think in general, I just enjoyed all of the episodes I've seen so far. Yeah, I appreciated that this show has has a real array of villains to choose from. I mean, I guess this is an Elmore Leonard thing too, Laura. You would know better than me. You know his fiction much better. But there's kind of this, it's almost like this deck of cards of different villain types that are spread out. There's the main villain who is something between a kind of a psychopath lone, you know, a sort of a lone shark psychopath, but who also seems to be wrapped up in the entire criminal underworld of Detroit. And then there's his kind of ditzy stoner girlfriend. There's a bunch of Albanian gangsters that get involved later in the season. Um, There's a judge who's assassinated. I mean, there's it is definitely a dense novel's worth of different crimes and criminals that are being pursued. So it makes each episode a little bit different. It doesn't just feel like one guy and his nemesis who he's chasing which I thought added to the interest. I think my favorite character, besides the Raylan Givens character, is probably uh, the lawyer, played by Ingenue Ellis, who, as the season goes on, um, emerges as both a kind of romantic foil and also somebody who's possibly involved in the corruption of the city of Detroit. She is a lawyer for some of the main criminals on the show. You have reason to suspect my client is involved in the murder of Judge Guy. And Rose Doyle, yes. And what is that? Witnesses. Shit, you got no witnesses. He's blowing smoke up your ass. Not another word unless I ask you a question. She is an interestingly, um, a figure who's suspended sort of, you know, between the the side of the law and, and the side of the criminals. And I found her performance and that character really fascinating. I think the weakest part of the show is unfortunately Vivian Oliphant. Yeah, <laughs> and I hate to say, yeah. I'm not going to say too much because I don't want to be mean to a young actress. But, you know, she does not 
at the moment um, really rise to the level of somebody who should be acting opposite her dad. And uh, and so the moment that she gets packed off, as we heard in that clip, was to me almost a sigh of relief that I didn't have to have more awkward father-daughter moments uh, with that actress. Yeah, I, in addition to her just having this little Betty Boop voice where you really have to turn on the, um, the closed captions in order to even see what's being said, is the whole device of the bad guy going after the family of the lawman is so tired that I just was groaning when it came up. So when she got sent away, I was like, oh, we're not going to have the climactic moment where he like kidnaps the daughter and drags her into some deserted warehouse. And then they're chasing and shouting, you know, things at each other. I just, I'm so grateful that that didn't happen uh, or hopefully is not going to happen. I am a little confused though, is why? he is in Detroit? Because don't they live in Miami? Well, the whole plot, it relies on a lot of coincidences, which maybe yeah. will maybe later in the season, I'm now, I think, five episodes in, uh, maybe they'll be explained as not as coincidental as they seemed. But I can think of, without spoiling anything, at least two different times, including the reason that he ends up in Detroit in the first place, where essentially just two important characters in, you know, the world of crime and crime fighting happen to coincide on a highway, (laughs) right? I mean, basically that you happen to be driving alongside the very person that you will soon be, you know, pursuing through the halls of justice. And yeah, a lot of that, there just has to be be some pretty heavy suspension of disbelief on the part of the, the viewer to believe that these things are happening at all. What did you guys think about Boyd Holbrook? characterization of Clement Mansell, who's the main villain, I sort of actually really loved it. Um, I was prepared to be disappointed because I really love uh, Boyd Crowder, played by Walton Goggins, as previously described um, in the original series. Um, But this new main antagonist is, he's kind of like a, a sociopathic, pathetic guy at the same time he's like he's got like this desire to have a singing career which is like one of the only nods to the milieu of Detroit (laughs) but anyway uh Clement Mansell is uh the stoner girlfriend at one point (laughs) Raylan asks her why are you with him and she goes he's fun (laughs) Um, (laughs) which is a a funny moment because he's like a just a absolute disaster he's just like shooting people through pillows constantly like at the at the least provocation um and he just kind of gets away with everything in this you know uh like i'm a sociopathic villain in a um elmore leonard novel kind of a way um but i you know i enjoyed him when he was on screen i thought he was fun too what did you guys think yeah, he yeah. was who I was thinking of when I said, you know, there's an unusual array of villains. It's not just him, but yeah, he 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 reminds me, he could be somebody from sort of an early Tarantino film or something as well, just yeah. walking around in his tidy whities and there's a moment that he sort of like scratches his junk through his tidy whities with his gun, and it's yeah. just so <laughs> gross and funny. <laughs> yeah, he's he's both ridiculous and terrifying at the same time, which is which is an accomplishment. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's a good, that's a really good way to put it. Well, I'm also wondering how you guys feel about the romance in this, because I Mm. thought is, I really have enjoyed it. I feel like um, the Carolyn Wilder character is the kind of character we see on television a lot. She's like a middle-aged black woman in a position of authority, and she's exasperated a lot of the time by the trifling people that she has to deal with. And that type of character usually does not get laid. And and in this, yeah. <laughs> she and Raylan have all this chemistry. And there's just this way that the two of them are like, yeah, still got it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's a silver fox. And, and, and she's like, she both doesn't trust him. And she's also like, yeah, I nailed it. You know, it's, it's, I really, I really enjoyed that relationship. I totally agree. I also like that what makes him turned on by her initially is that she cross-examines him in the trial of this guy who tried to carjack him and um, just kind of wipes the floor with him. And he's just like, that yeah. is what, that's what does it for him. He's <laughs> like, I need more. <laughs> you were going to put a black man in the trunk of your car. If necessary, I would have put a white man in there, too. Your Honor, the marshal is not the one on trial here. Give me a minute, and he will be. 
Yeah, Raylan is like a person who keeps a lot of details in his head, and he's like, you keep more details in your head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're making me realize as you guys talk about this show that, I mean, what's really unusual about it, I think, is that each of the characters has their own way of speaking. And that so often mm. is not true in TV procedurals, right? There's sort of like Very the cop true. language and the crime yeah. language and, and everybody who's in that group, whether it's the cops or the criminals or the victims, all speak the same. Whereas, and I guess this again is, you know, inherited from the world of, of Elmore Leonard. I'm not sure how closely the dialogue hues to actual dialogue from his, his books, but uh, but everybody speaks like themselves, <laughs> and that that in itself sets the show apart. All right. Well, I don't know about the two of you, but I'm certainly going to watch this through to the end. I think uh, it's now being released weekly. The first six ep episodes are already streaming on Hulu, and the show is Justified City Primeval. So please, listeners, if you see it and you have something to tell us about it, email us at culturefest at slate.com. All right, moving on. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey, listeners, whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance, too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote, and you'll be able to choose the best option for you, fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company & Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. This episode is supported by About the Journey, an original podcast from Marriott Bonvoy Traveler. What does it mean to travel better? In season three of About the Journey, travel journalist Onika Raymond takes us on a journey to discover the lesser known sides of six iconic cities around the globe. This season, she's picked six under the radar neighborhoods where she'll meet with in the know locals to experience what makes their homes one of a kind. From a Dominican jewel of Upper Manhattan to London's Nigerian British community known as Little Lagos, Onika connects us with locals who can speak to the heart of the dynamic neighborhoods we're traveling to. They'll tell us where to go, what to do, and how to see the world in more sustainable and meaningful ways. About the Journey emphasizes local experiences and provides an intimate and exciting new perspective to popular destinations like Washington, D.C. and Denver. Search for About the Journey in your podcast player. We'll also include a link in our show notes. Thanks to About the Journey for their support. The former NFL star Michael Orr, whose life story became the subject of a nonfiction book turned Oscar winning movie called The Blind Side, has filed a lawsuit against the Memphis family that took him in as a high school athlete and used their financial and social clout to help launch his college and eventually professional football career. Orr's lawsuit alleges that this family, the Tuies, benefited financially from his success in football and from the profits of the book and the movie based on his life story. Orr has been estranged from the Tui family for about 10 years, but he says it was only early this year that he realized that the legal relationship he had with them was not the equivalent of an adoption. Rather, it was a conservatorship, a legal relationship that generally only gets set up when one of the parties has an intellectual or physical disability that prevents them from acting on their own behalf, which was, of course, not the case in, in this situation. There is a lot going on in this story. I probably haven't even touched on all the basics of the of the lawsuit yet. But given the familiarity of, you know, most Americans with the movie The Blind Side, maybe that's a place to start. Rebecca, I, I'll start with you. As we were choosing our topics for this week, you were very interested in talking about this one in particular. What was it about The Blind Side and Michael Orr's story that, that made you want to take it on for the podcast? Oh, yeah. Well, I... Um uh, I think it was the fall of 2008. Um, I was teaching a rhetoric and composition class at the University of Texas at Austin as a graduate student. And we had that university at the time did one of those everyone on campus reads this book kind of programs. And the book was The Blind Side by Michael Lewis. And so uh, the rhetoric and composition program had a thing where they said, OK, we're going to take the all campus book and make that the basis of the like first year writing class. So I taught a whole semester of The Blind Side, um, basically pulling out topics from it, trying to get kids to think critically about it, trying to get the students to, um, you know, uh, like figure out what it was about the different topics that were in the book that they were interested in, et cetera. And I found it extremely difficult. Um, 
I don't know if you guys have read the Michael Lewis book, but it's um, there were a lot of sort of dynamics that were in it that at the time people that weren't in like higher level academia didn't really talk about that often. So sort of like the, the question of, uh, you know, when an interracial adoption happens, or as the case was, this was not an adoption, as we now know, um, but the two is called it an adoption. Um, you know, what are the, like how, how the dynamics there work, let the white savior complex, which is something that now that everyone's so online, people know as like a reference or like a way to, like a theoretical tool to kind of talk about um, what can happen when a story like this unfolds, where a white family uh, adopts a non-white kid and sort of like pumps themselves up publicly for having done it in various ways. Um, you know, all of those sort of things were very hard to get the kids who admittedly in my class were mostly white uh, to sort of articulate in satisfying ways. Um, they were very taken by the story. They loved it. Um, you know, they wanted to engage with the Michael Lewis book on the Michael Lewis book's terms, which are basically like, look at this heartwarming story of a kid who um, is basically plucked from obscurity and from like the way that Michael Lewis tells it, it's sort of, he's sort of plucked from uh, like ignorance basically. Um, and sort of made into a person of the world by this wealthy family, who we should say are were Michael Lewis's friends, or he went to, uh, I believe, high school with the father of the family. Um, anyway, what's interesting to me is how much has changed between 2008 and now. The way that people talk about it is so different. Um, the way this lawsuit has hit has sort of, people have like a different vocabulary to speak about it. Do you think, Rebecca, that if you were teaching that same class now, those students would have a completely different response? Gosh, I hope so. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> you yeah. know? I mean, that, that was also before the movie came out. And it's interesting because, uh, you know, there's been a lot since this lawsuit, like the news of this lawsuit hit, there's been a lot of ink spilled online <laughs> about um, both the movie and the book. And people have pointed out that when the movie came out, there was like sort of like a nascent uh like critical strain around it um, there was i yes. remember that yeah yes did you see the movie laura you no know? i mean i am against football so i will never see a oh. movie in which football is glorified <laughs> so um i did see the movie back when it came out but i remember being relieved that i didn't have to review it i think it was josh levine that wrote on it for slate which makes sense because you know he writes on sports a lot and has a sports podcast um, but yeah, like Laura, I'm not a football person. Don't watch it. Don't really think that it should exist in the form that it currently does exist. And probably thought about the movie more negatively because of that than, you know, really huh. thinking in depth about the story. But you're right, Rebecca, mm -hmm. that it, it shows how, as far as we have to go, how far we have come in our thinking about, you know, white saviorism and, and transracial adoption and things like that since 2009, because I feel like that movie would, would land a lot more unpleasantly were it to be released now. Then again, if you look at Green Book or other more recent Oscar fave type movies that, that also have fairly reactionary racial setups, maybe not, you know? And people right. people love to feel inspired by a, a feel-good, you know, hands-across-the-aisle story about race. And maybe that, that those strings still could be pulled. Well, about race and also about football and the whole idea of sports as being something that brings people from different walks of life together in some positive way, as opposed to something that gives them brain damage. Oh, is, uh, Laura, we cared about brain damage for like three months in uh, 2018, and then everyone started watching the NFL again. Remember when yeah. everyone was like, oh, the NFL is going to be over because of the CTE story. And then now it's just like just as powerful as it ever was. Uh, if, you, if, you, yeah. if you know someone who's suffered from it, it's just like you can never really look at football the same way again. Yeah. I mean, in a way, like I looked at it as, you know, this family adopted him and then just exploited him by putting him in this incredibly dangerous situation instead of giving him like a healthy, uh, viable way to make his living through the future. I mean, 
that would be that was my position about it back then, and I don't think I feel that differently about it now. Although on the legal level, it does seem to be an incredibly murky situation. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit early to talk about you know exactly whose numbers are are correct, but I mean, according to the to the lawyer for the Tui family, the profits from the book and the movie, which were not that extensive, you know, after um, after agents' fees and taxes and so forth, were equally shared among the members of the family, Michael Lewis and Michael Orr. So I'm not sure if whatever needs to be hashed out is going to be hashed out in terms of the absolute numbers of profit. You know, it seems like it does have more to do with, well, a little bit, not unrelated to the Britney Spears situation of being under a conservatorship from her father for all of those years. It's more of a, of a question of, you know, having your agency taken away by by someone else taking over the legal rights to your life. In the in the Tui's defense, it does not seem as though they have enforced the conservatorship. I mean, it sounds like he has proceeded to act as his own agent in in the past twenty years. It's not like they have swooped in and said, "Oh, we have to sign off on the house you bought or the contract you signed," or you know, it. it from what I can tell, they're saying that they made it a conservatorship because they needed to establish a legal relationship with him quickly enough that he could enroll in Ole Miss, which they have some special connection to that that will enable their dependents to, to have an in on getting into the university and then play football. And that then after that, they never really bothered to make it a legal adoption. But it it doesn't sound as though throughout his entire adult life, they've been running his finances. It sounds like he only just found out that that's the nature of the legal relationship, which you think he would find out as an adult if they were actually enforcing it. I see what you mean. Like there would have been a time along the way where he would have been like, wait a minute, (laughs) what's going on here? Um, Yeah. But it sounds like his... um, think correctly, um, or I don't know who, who can say whose feelings are correct or incorrect, but um, it sounds like he was very hurt by this revelation. Um, who can blame him? I yeah. know. I mean, it sounds it sounds like they have been representing themselves as adoptive parents. So it, it's interesting because um, adoption itself has been... I hate this word so much, but problematized <laughs> so much in sort of like recent uh, recent years. You know, there have been a number of memoirs from uh, transracial adoptees that have sort of tried to complicate this idea that they should be grateful or that there's that you know people who adopt kids from overseas are like saints and saviors, and um, you know that the kids can never like say anything bad about their families. Um, but in a way, it's like he's not even this dynamic is even more complicated because he's sort of saying, Hey, they even it's one layer deeper than that. They said they adopted me, but they hadn't actually. Um, so one has to sort of wonder, you know, and the fact I didn't, the fact that I just learned that they've been out of touch for a decade or, 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 or more, it kind of complicates it as well. Um, you know, he's 37 or 38, I think. Um, and he's sort of, you know, maybe he's taking stock of his life and thinking about what it was like to be a kid in that circumstance, um, you know, taken from one world and put in another and then told that he had been taken from one world and put in another by like the entire world and the story of his taking and like making over becoming this like Hollywood staple. And then, you know, he says that he feels like in his time negotiating contracts with various uh, like NFL entities that he was undersold or that he, the, the perception was that he was like the guy in the movie, which is mm-hmm. to say like slow and not very smart. Um, and he feels like he made less money because of that. Or like he, and also like, it also just has to hurt your feelings to constantly be sort of represented that way. Yeah. Right. He's been vocal for years, I think, about not liking the movie The Blind Side and not liking the way he is portrayed in it. And some of the I was reminded of some of the more insulting moments in The Blind Side in reading about this. I didn't rewatch the movie for this, but things started to come back to me as I was reading about it, like a scene where the son of the Tuies, so, you know, a middle school or so aged boy is is showing him different football plays like using condiments on a table. No. See, this just means that you're going to block whoever's in front of you or on your inside shoulder. 
if you're not covered by a defender. Now, I'll be the running back, and you show me what you're supposed to do. Ready? Hi. You know, like explaining football to him and just really sort of making it look as if, you know, it was not just a, a, a financial hand that they extended to him, but that they sort of, you know, built him up into the player that he was. And and the adult Michael Orr has looked back on this saying, look, I was, you know, analyzing plays on on TV football replays since I was a kid, you know, that he was bringing his analytical intelligence as well as his physical skill to playing football and did not need to be tutored by a child. You know, I think the movie is probably full of things like that, that that now just strike him as a a humiliating way of framing his own history. And it's exactly those things that made that movie popular among the Green Book liking audience. I mean, you know, you can see Hollywood does what Hollywood does and takes the, you know, the outlines of complicated, like relatively complicated story that Michael Lewis tells. Although I would argue that the book itself is still pretty um, like damning in some ways, look, looked back at now um, and sort of ups, wants to up the contrast between the or uh, Michael Orr and the Tuies because that's a movie, you know, the more contrast there is, the better the movie is. Um, but too bad it's also racist. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Um, you know, and then they made a ton of money from it. Um, I don't know if it's the Tuies who are the ones who can be sued for that, but it sucks. Like, it's a bad outcome. Sometimes people go to the legal system to seek recourse against somebody, and it isn't always necessarily the person who is the most exploitative. It sounds like Michael Lewis has been straightforward about the fi- the finances, uh, you know, the, the income that everyone received for the rights to the book, and those numbers look legit to me, and I don't think it would be very easy for him to lie about them since um, other people have those numbers. But um, you don't actually get that much money for that sort of thing. You get money for working on the movie, not for creating the material that the movie is based on. And um, if if there were a movie that depicted me as, as sort of simple minded out there, I would be so furious. And who are, who are you going to sue? You know, I mean, this is, this is, I mean, arguably they, the Tuies could have defended him against this portrayal, you know, if, if That's a good they point. felt, you yeah. know, I mean, they, they were his guardians and to some degree and should have stood up for him. All right. Well, all of this is still unfolding. This lawsuit was only filed, I believe, last week. So I'm sure that there will be further chapters unfolding in the story of Michael Orr versus the Tuies and the blind side. So we'll keep an eye on that. The Jedi fell a long time ago. Perhaps it is time to begin again. The highly anticipated Star Wars series, Ahsoka, arrives Tuesday on Disney+. Plus. Something dark is coming. One must destroy in order to create. The galaxy is not safe. Don't miss the two-episode premiere. We have to prepare for the worst. Hunt them down. Let's get going. Ahsoka, two-episode premiere, streaming Tuesday, only on Disney+. Plus. Wow, well, we've done it. We've reached the moment in the show where we endorse our favorite cultural item of the week. Uh, Laura, I'm going to start with you. What have you been reading, watching, experiencing that you want to tell us about? Well, it's going to be watching. Um, My quest for new detective series that aren't stupid or cliched is never ending. And I found a great one on Prime called Deadlock. And that's spelled, it's all one word, D-E-A-D-L-O-C-H. It's set in Tasmania in a little town that uh, is sort of in transition from having a fishing economy to, you know, maybe a little bit of a tourism economy. And it's a town that has been, um, has had a big influx of new residents who are lesbians. And the main character is a, she's a police officer. She's like a former detective. Um, but she basically is the main detective in, in this, in this series, um, who is herself a lesbian is in a relationship with, um, a a woman who wants them to buy a farm and do the kind of whole crunchy organic 
back to the land lesbian thing and there's a lesbian um restaurateur and it's just it's it's like there's a lot of lesbians in this series which is really refreshing and it's particularly piquant because the series of murders that sort of slowly evolve and become the central mystery are all of men but it's just really really funny and as someone who lives in a small town and has a lot of lesbian friends it who live here as well it is so incredibly um spot on in all of the cultural stuff that i just was just in stitches through the whole thing but it, it is also a series that it has a genuine mystery like it's genuinely mysterious you it's complicated you know there you, there's a plot to follow that is just as good as any detective series but then it also has all of this delicious sort of social satire in it that um that is just a blast to watch Oh, you know who's Allie that sounds so completely up is Stephen Metcalf. I have to make sure he hears, <laughs> if he doesn't listen to the show, that he hears that endorsement. Because between the down under angle and the, you know, genre mystery bit, I think he would he would flip for that. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca, what about you? What have you got to endorse this week? I just finished reading a new memoir. It's called Holler Rat. And it's by a woman named Anya Liftig. And it's a, sto- it's a memoir about... Uh, being she's not from it her mother is from like a deep Appalachian location um and her mother basically sort of uh left permanently as a young adult and met a Jewish man from the northeast married him and ended up settling in Connecticut and so the writer is um spends every summer in the you know in her mother's hometown with her grandmother who's like a a wonderful character as created by this writer like a a very fascinating person um and so the writer is you know it's funny because i i picked it up initially because i actually knew this writer at undergrad but i didn't uh know anything about her life story at all she's one of those people that i sort of you know uh, was in some classes with or had intersected with in various ways but never um, truly befriended and I just am like oh my gosh was were these kinds of people walking around <laughs> like her story is so intense and interesting um, and I'm like man once again I had the thought my undergrad was wasted on me <laughs> like I didn't I was not prepared to, <laughs> to sort of uh, uh, intersect with people the way that I maybe should have but anyway that aside it's just fascinating it's about her sort of coming to terms with um, you know she goes to the elite school and then ends up a performance artist in New York. And it's sort of about uh, the way that this, it's not her upbringing, but her mother's upbringing and her summers in Appalachia uh, kind of influence her and leave her feeling like she's always got half a foot in one place and half a foot in another place. Uh, The writing is incredibly vivid and beautiful. Um, Again, it's called Holler Rat by Anya Liftig. And I loved it. Oh, that's fantastic. That sounds so good. And it also flows so perfectly out of our justified segment. Oh, yeah, (laughs) exactly. You actually have an Appalachian endorsement for the week. So that's perfect. There you go. All right. Because you both endorse things that take a fair amount of time, reading a whole book and watching a whole TV show, I'm going to go short, simple, and somewhat dumb, <laughs> but but incredibly pleasing for my endorsement, which is to tell everyone that uh, whether or not you've seen Barbie, I'm sure you're familiar with the song I'm Just Ken, the Ryan Gosling number that I believe has now broken onto the, the Hot 100. <laughs> Chris Melanchthon wow. could fill us in more there, but <laughs> I think it's actually starting to climb the charts now as a potential song of the summer. It's one of the high points of the movie. I'm just Ken, where I see love, she sees a friend. What will it take for her to see the man behind the tent and fight for me? And the thing that I'm endorsing is not the song I'm Just Ken itself, but a video that was just released, I think, yesterday, showing Ryan Gosling rehearsing the number. So it's basically, you know, a behind-the-scenes glimpse of the making of Barbie. And you see a couple shots from the movie, you know, the, the finished movie, but mainly rehearsal footage with a bunch of, you know, dancers in sweats rehearsing the dance, which I always love to see as a fan of the movie fame. Like, I, I'll always fall for watching dancers rehearse in their, their sweats. Uh, you see a little bit of Greta Gerwig directing behind the monitor and cracking up at Gosling's choices. 
You see uh, Mark Ronson, who is the co-writer of the song, you know, on set watching it, and Simu Liu, who plays another of the Kens dancing. It's just super, super fun um, to see how it all sort of came together backstage, and the song is just irresistible. So we'll put a link on the show page, but it's uh, it's the backstage video to the rehearsal of I'm Just Ken. Baby. Oh! Laura, thanks so much for coming on this week and at very short notice at that. I really appreciate it. Always a pleasure. And Rebecca, it's always fun to have you on. It's been too long. I hope you'll come back on again soon. Oh, for sure. Thanks so much. Listeners, you can find links to some of the things we talked about today on our show page, including links to our endorsements. That's at slate.com slash culturefest. You can always also email us at culturefest at slate.com. Our intro music is by the wonderful composer Nicholas Brittell. Our production assistant is Kat Hong. Our producer is Cameron Drews. I'm Dana Stevens. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll talk to you again next week. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and the Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now.